Good morning, it's nine o'clock, so we will begin worship. It's nine o'clock here. Some of you are watching this at another time, and it could be nine o'clock tonight, but it would still be nine o'clock, get it? I didn't say a.m. or p.m., so it's, we're good all day. Um, it is nine o'clock in the sanctuary, so we begin this service. Welcome to everybody who's joining us today, either via Zoom or on a video, eventually throughout the day or even throughout the week. Um, we're glad that you've uh, chosen to worship with Lakeview Lutheran Church. Um, I don't usually say this, but since uh, it's uh, um, the holiday season and everybody else is sending you mail about uh, providing funds, charitable funds, I remind you that your offerings are most welcome here. You can mail them to the church office or drop them off at the church office, put them in the mailbox outside the door, or pound on the door and let uh, uh, Laura or I know that you're here and we'd be glad to receive your envelope or gifts um, you can also um, support Lakeview Lutheran Church by going to the website and giving through the Vanco Give Plus program. You can use credit cards or checks on that site. So thank you for your continued financial um, support. Linda Shack is on Zoom right now, and she's nodding her head. Yes, keep it up, keep it up. We like to, we like to have, um, be sure that we are funding our ministry here. Our ministry is going strong in the food pantry. Um, all records were broken last month in the food pantry disbursement of food with families and individuals. So um, those guys down there, men and women, are working very hard to make that happen. Um, blood drive was huge on Thursday. Five, six, sixty. What Terry's giving me finger signals, and because it's Terry, they're legit. Yeah, now I'm getting the one. <laughs> Um, it was 61 units, so I got the 60, and then I got the 1, and I can see some of you laughing, so you understand what Terry is doing behind your heads. 61 units of blood given on Thursday. That's tremendous. That's another, I think that might be a record. No, not quite a record, but a huge uh, double sometimes what we've given in the past. So this has been a huge year. Um, that is just so cool. Also, we have, are receiving lots of reservations for the meal on Tuesday the 22nd in the evening, the scalloped potatoes and ham. If you haven't made a reservation, um, be sure you call Laura by, by this Tuesday uh, because the, uh, that's when we do the cutoff so that we can plan for food and shop and all of that stuff accordingly. Um, once again, the Christmas Eve service will be posted on December 24th. Uh, it will be available online, on uh, your Facebook page, on, on YouTube, or you can access that by going to the website and finding YouTube or Vimeo videos and see the Christmas service. So it's there. Once it goes up on the 24th, it will be there forever. So you can um, celebrate Christmas with your family and Lakeview at any time you want. We appreciate all the people who are working on music for that service. Um, today we're actually going to be able to record some of that music after this worship service. Um, and we'll be doing that throughout the next week so that Terry can put it all together for the 24th. Don't forget that on Sunday the 27th, the service will be videoed in advance and will be available, but it will not be available on Zoom that day. So you can't Zoom in the Sunday after Christmas, but you can find that service um, recorded and available through Facebook and uh, YouTube and the same routine. And then on Sunday, January 3rd, which is my final weekend here, um, we are going to be live streaming that service. So you will be able to um, get a link, and actually I might have even sent that out already, but I'll do it in the future, a link to the YouTube spot where um, that service will be available at 8.55 a.m. It will become live, and you'll be able to be a part of that service um, on January 3rd. So I will silence everything, and I thank Chris Kirst for singing this morning. I will silence everything, and we will prepare our hearts for worship uh, during Lynn's prelude. However, if you're watching this as a video, you will have an opportunity now to uh, see all of the ornaments that are on the Christmas tree. <laughs>
Holy God, as you anointed Jesus with your spirit to comfort mourners, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim release to prisoners, and break good news to the oppressed, so anoint us as Christ's living body to go and to do likewise. At this time, we'll be lighting the Advent wreath. If you're lighting candles at home, I invite you to do that as well. If you have a pink candle, today is the day you light the pink candle. It represents joy, although Pastor Mary Farmer would tell you that they were hoping for a girl. We light the third Advent candle as a sign of hope and joy that the Spirit of God may anoint us to show God's liberating love. Let us pray. Living God, proclaim liberty to captives. Set us free so that we may free others by doing what is right and avoiding evil. Bind our wounds that we may heal others. Fill us with your Spirit and your love. Amen. The reading on this third weekend of Advent comes from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you faithful, and Jesus will do this. Well, as we've noted for the last two weeks, this is the third week, I've been waiting every weekend to hear O Come, Come, Emmanuel. She finally got it in today. She knows how much I don't love that song, but I know a lot of people do, so thank you, Lynn, for uh, making sure that we hear it during Advent. But we're still in Advent, it's the third weekend, and, and as many of you know, we're Lutherans, and Lutherans refer to Advent quite frequently as the already, but not yet. That means that these four weeks of time we have set aside to remember that Christ has already come to us at Christmas. We're going to celebrate that in two weeks. It's a time, Advent is a time to remember that God's victory over sin and death has already happened. It's already happened at the death and resurrection of Jesus. And... Advent is also a time to remember that Christ has not yet come, not yet come to establish the full revelation of God's kingdom and love. We've always understood that the Christ born in a manger will indeed return and usher in a new heaven and a new earth where God's justice and peace will prevail. The already and the not yet. Now another way of thinking about Advent is that it's the season where we talk about living in the in-between time. Christmas, Christians today live in a time that falls, be, 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 that falls between the first Christmas and the final Christmas. I like to call it Christmas 1 and Christmas 2, sort of like a movie and its sequel. Now in the movies, however, the sequel is usually disappointing and never as good as the first or the original show. But when it comes to the second Christmas, we will not be disappointed. It will be far superior to that first one where we talk about a baby being born in a manger. Over the centuries, God's faithful people from all creeds, from all theologies, from all religious movements, have used a lot of energy and a lot of effort to try and figure out how we should live in this in-between time. What should we be doing as we wait? Not just during Advent, but the in-between time is every day of our lives. What should we be doing while we live in this time? 
And there's been lots of energy poured into trying to calculate when this in-between time will end. In the letters to the church in the city of Thessalonica, the author today attempts to address a variety of issues that those people are dealing with. What we're reading today is just a small glimpse of the whole book of Thessalonians and this whole idea of what people are struggling with. But the issues being addressed in the church there in Thessalonica are the very same issues that our, church, our churches in the world address today. The letter to the Thessalonians talks about community tensions and right living. And it talks about the life death, and the second coming of Christ. If you read all of chapter 5, not just these few verses, but all of chapter 5, you would also find out that the author talks about relationships with other people. Since God called us, created us to live in community with each other, these relationships are pretty darn important. They are really important as we live today in a pluralistic or a multicultural world. No longer can we say that America is filled with Christians or America is a Christian nation. America is a multicultural nation. Laura, our office administrator, is at seminary right now, as many of you know, and she's actually taking a class right now. It's her favorite class. It's called Jesus in a Pluralistic World. She likes it, but it's real hard. She's actually watching right now, so she's probably complaining at home. She's got a final exam this week. Good luck, Laura. It's good for me to know, and for you to know as well, that our seminaries are training future pastors, future leaders in the church, about how to relate to humans from other religions and other walks of life in this pluralistic world that we live in. The relationships that we are called to have with others should characterize the holiness of the Christian community. Notice they should characterize the holiness, not arrogance. Arrogance is when we think we're better than others, or that we're the only ones, or that we're the only ones who have it right, or that nobody else could possibly be loved by God. That's arrogance. We're not talking about that. We're talking about holiness. Geez, Laura, I hope they're teaching you this in seminary. Putting ourselves above, above other people in our communities, in our culture, in our world, is not holy. An outsider, somebody who knows nothing about you or your faith, an outsider should be able to see that we are a follower of Christ by observing how we relate and how we interact with other people. Let me pause here a moment and let you think about that. Do people outside of the faith community know that you are a follower of Christ when they see how you respond to your neighbors? Your neighbors at home, throughout the city, throughout the nation, and throughout the world. Remember that when you get angry in the checkout line. When someone says, I'm not going to wear a mask because it violates my civil rights. How is that reflecting a concern for other people? I don't wear that mask during worship so that you can actually hear me, but I wear that stupid mask all the time, and I wear it for you, even if you happen to be one of those who refuse to put one on. So. In chapter 5 of this letter, the author identifies a list of appeals for how to be in a healthy relationship with other people. These appeals include respect leaders, be at peace, help the weak, do not repay evil for evil, but do good to all, pray unceasingly, give thanks, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecy, but test it. Hold on to what is good. Abstain from what is evil. The author of this book has given us some very valuable tools to use in this in-between time. As we await Christmas too, 
We have been called to be alert with patience. We have been called to remember that God is the example of gracious patience for each one of us. We have been called to stop trying to find an external event that we think will mark the return of Christ. The pandemic is not it. We have been called to be attentive to our call as God's people to live in relationships with others in a pluralistic world and to utilize that list that I just read that we found in the letter to the Thessalonians. We've been called to hold fast to what is good and to abstain from what is evil. And if you understand the Bible, you know that good behavior is repeatedly defined by loving God and loving our neighbor. We are repeatedly told in the books of the New Testament that the way to love God is to love our neighbors, to love the people of God's creation. And our love is visible through our everyday, ordinary works for justice and for equality and for acceptance of all. So instead of spending this in-between time trying to figure out when Jesus is coming or flaunting some arrogant Christian superiority, we will be better off spending the time assuring that racist ideologies and behaviors are wiped out, just like we hope that the vaccine will wipe out the coronavirus. We will be better off spending our time in this in-between time changing our lifestyles to reduce food waste so that hungry people have access to that food. We will be better off in this in-between time educating ourselves about our neighbors who might be Muslim. We could use some of our energy in this in-between time to work to bring respect and, to, and integrity to undocumented workers in this nation, people who are actually needed here in order to keep the farming industry in this wonderful white-covered state of Wisconsin alive. We know what is good and what is evil. We know it. Advent is a time to explore and think and reevaluate and advocate and define how to hold fast to what is good and then how to avoid what is evil. And we do that because God's love for us is always there. Amen. The hymn today is Comfort, Comfort, Now My People, ELW 256. Thank you to Chris Kirst for singing.
Let us pray. God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Tolerant God, keep us grounded in you as we celebrate that Jesus has already been born, but that he will return to bring your peace and justice to the earth. During this in-between time, give us the courage and the desire to strengthen our relationship with each other. Protect us from arrogance. Move us to celebrate the pluralism of your world. Guide us to be holy. We pray for the church and for this congregation as a time of transition begins for Lakeview. Be with those who will lead Lakeview throughout this time. We give thanks for the vaccine and ask for hearts that will be thoughtful and caring as the distribution begins. Give many of us who will wait the desire to make wise decisions to stop the spread of the virus. We thank you for all those who continue to support our food pantry as we continue to break records with participants. Thank you for those who participated in the blood drive this week as large amounts of blood were received there. May we be sensitive to all those for, wh for whom this time of year is difficult. Protect us from depression and suicidal thoughts. Bring comfort to all who grieve today and bring healing hope to those who are ill, including Mary, Sandy, Pam, Georgia, and anyone else whom we now name out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for everyone in need. Amen. Together we pray the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. In the meditation music today that you're going to hear in a minute, Lynn will play a very familiar carol. It is entitled, The First Noel. Noel. English speakers borrowed the word Noel from the French. The word can be traced back to the Latin word natalis. That word actually means birthday as a noun, or it can be um, defined as relating to birth as an adjective. A modern synonym for Noel is the word Christmas. Noels were being sung in Latin and French for centuries before the word found its way into the American English language somewhere in the 1800s. The earliest known musical use of the word Noel in America occurred in the text of a Christmas motet called Nova Vobis Gaudiae. And that was written, well actually this wasn't in America, it was written in the 1400s. The first Noel is a traditional English folk tune that came out of Cornwall, England. The author of the words is unknown. The piece was first published in 1823 in song form in a song book entitled Carols Ancient and Modern. John Stainer arranged the music that we know today, and he first published that arrangement in his book entitled Carols, Catchy title, wasn't it? And that was in 1871. The first Noel is included in our hymnal, the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Book. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs>
Thank you, Lynn. Now receive the blessing. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long expected savior, fill you with love. The unexpected spirit, guide your journey now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.